Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you this morning for the wonderful privilege that we have to be called sons of God. And Lord, that we have boldness to come before the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace in time of need because of what Jesus has done for us. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, the one that enlightens us, the one that teaches us, the one that guides us, the one that is here to glorify Jesus. Holy Spirit, I just welcome you in this house right now. Let your presence fill this place. Let every life be touched that's hearing my voice today. Whether they're here or whether they're hearing me by Sozo or later on through the recorded messages, let them be touched by the power of the living God. And Lord, for everything that will be done here today, we'll give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Everybody said? Amen. Tell two people you're going to be blessed today. I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, the 8th the chapter, verse 9. And I want to talk to you this morning. I, I only wish I had like about three, three services to minister this to you, but I don't. So I'm going to have to teach, preach. So when you, when you teach, preach, you know, that means you don't read all the scriptures. So if I preach something, I'm going to tell you where the scripture is, and I would encourage you to write it down, and then later on, when you get home, at some point, read it. Amen? Uh, so that you get the word of God inside of your heart, because that's the only word that's going to work for you when you get it inside of your heart. I want to talk to you about uh, 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 entitled a message entitled, He Came to Make You Rich. Now, you know, a lot of people, when they think about salvation, they think about, you know, going to heaven and, uh, you know, not going to hell. And that's, that's good, you know. But there's a whole lot more to salvation. You know, Jesus just came, didn't just come to save our spirits. He came to redeem us totally, spirit, soul, and body. And the Bible actually says that he became poor, that we might be made rich. Uh, and that is found in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. This is, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Now, you know, the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew. And uh, you can get a, a concordance, such as Strong's Concordance or Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament words, and look up these words and find out what they mean originally. And the word, because, you know, some people say, well, yeah, that's just talking about spiritual. No, it's not. The word rich here is talking about material wealth. And that's not saying that Jesus was rich in heaven and came down to the earth and became poor because it's impossible for someone who kept the law of Moses, and Jesus did without breaking it, remarkable feat, because there's over, over 600 commandments in it that he kept all his life, the 33 and a half years that he lived here, and, um, <clears throat> and, he, was, and he kept it perfectly. And anybody who kept the law of Moses, according to Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 through 14, was blessed. In one way, he was blessed economically. So Jesus was no means poor on this earth. Matter of fact, when he was born at his birth, the wise men came from the east. These wise men had died under, under the ministry of Daniel. They, they, that's how they knew about the star. It's prophesied in the word of God about the star that would reveal the Messiah, and they followed that star. And, and so they came to him, and, you know, we see in, in religious pictures three wise men, but the Bible doesn't say that. It says the wise men came. There was a caravan of them, and they brought gifts to him. And you'll find that in Matthew, the second chapter, the board, frankincense, myrrh, and gold. It actually puts gold first. So right from the, from the get-go, Jesus was not broke. A uh, matter of fact, when, when he was brought for, to, to be crucified, the Bible says, and, and you'll read this in John, the 19th chapter, that the soldiers parted his clothes in four piles. But the tunic that w was without seam, uh, they cast lots that it, it was valuable. They didn't, want to they didn't want to tear it up. Now, when you study historical books, you'll find out that the only people that wore a tunic without seam was people that had some money. But he became poor on that cross. Why? Because poverty is a curse. Amen? Why? That a youth through his poverty might be made rich. And again, the word rich used there is talking about financial finances, material. Amen? God has a wealthy place for you and I. Not, not, now, nobody, not everybody attains to it. Are you following me? Because there are certain things you have to do. You don't get there just because you get born again. Now, that, that, that's the entrance in. You have to be born again. You have to be part of the family of God. But there are other things that you have to do, and we're, we're going to get to that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Matter of fact, this was the plan of God from the beginning. If you read the book of Genesis, which is the blueprint of God's will for man, you'll find in Genesis 1... In verse 26 to 28, that he gave man dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, 
everything that creepeth, everything that flies, and he blessed them. And that blessing was an empowerment for them to, to prosper, to succeed. And it goes on to say that he put, he, he put them in a garden, and in that garden there was rivers, and, it, and, and there, was, there was gold and precious stones. Amen. And you, and you read Genesis 1, you find that he reveals to him the, 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 the laws of sowing and reaping, which he in turn later on shared it with his sons. And we see Cain and Abel in Genesis 4 operating in the laws of sowing and reaping. Are you following me? So this was the plan of God from the beginning. And even though the devil came and, and tried to thwart the plan of God, uh, God hasn't deviated from his plan. And Jesus came to give good news to the poor. Matter of fact, go to the book of uh, Luke, the fourth chapter. Now, this, th everywhere that Jesus went, everywhere, this is the first message that he preached, everywhere he went. And he preaches all over Judea. And it was out of Isaiah 61. And he began his ministry preaching this message in a synagogue in Nazareth. And it says in... Uh, Verse 16, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, the word gospel means good news. What would be good news to a poor person? You don't have to be poor. Amen. You don't have to be homeless. Hello. You don't have to be broke. Amen. You don't have to drive a radio or a car. Some people don't even have that. The gospel, good news to the poor. The day of your poverty is over. That's what he's saying. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty of the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendants and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue was fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I came to do these things. Hello? Well, he hasn't stopped doing it. He was doing it back then. He's doing it now. And he preaches everywhere he went to. Look at Acts, the 10th chapter. And notice that the first thing he preached was the gospel to the poor. Acts, the 10th chapter, verse 36, the word, or we can say the message, which God sent to the children of Israel Preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word or that message, you know, which was proclaimed throughout all of Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism with John preached. Well, we just read where it began. And notice that this message was preached where? Throughout all Judea. By who? Jesus. And now the disciples picked up on it. And P Peter gives him the short version, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost Spirit and power and went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed with the devil, for God was with him. Well, delivering people from poverty is doing good, isn't it? Because poverty is an oppression. Amen. Have you ever been under pressure where you, where, where you have more bills than money? I've been there, done that. It's not fun. Amen. Thank God those days are over for me. Never to come back either. But I've been there. And I know the pressure and I know the stress that these things cause. Many of you do too. Amen. Most of us here weren't born with a golden spoon in our mouth. Amen. Now the Bible says in John 10, 10, Jesus said, I, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and have more abundantly. You can't have abundant life when you're broke. Huh? Amen. <laughs> now look at the, at the book of Galatians, the third chapter. Galatians, the third chapter. And let's start reading verse 13 and then 14. It says, Christ has, that's past tense, he's already done it, redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now the the Bible talks about the law. It's talking about the first five books of the Bible, commonly known as the Pentateuch, that were written by Moses. And in the law of Moses, and if you want to just do a, a short version of the study, just take the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. The first 13 verses reveal the blessing that came on a person that kept the law. Amen. Jesus kept it for us. 
verses 15 through 61 reveal the curses that would come on the persons that broke the law. And that is a threefold curse, poverty, sickness, and sin, or separation from God. So we can say Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? For it is written, curses everyone who hangs on the tree. So when he went to the tree, when he went to the cross, he took the curse of poverty, sickness, and sin. Why? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive this promise of the Spirit through faith. The promise that the Spirit made to Abraham. Amen? Along with the promise of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Is accessible to us. Now, let's prove this out a little further. The Bible says, and again, teach, preach, so write, write some of these scriptures things. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, 1 Peter 2.24, reveals that he carried away our sicknesses and our diseases, and by his stripes were healed. Amen. And then we read in 2 Corinthians 8.9 that he became poor, that through his poverty we might be made rich. So God has a wealthy place for you. Amen. But some people don't attain to it. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 that the things that happened to Israel were written for our admonition, our warning, particularly to us that are living in the last days. Now, God brought Israel which, out of Egypt, which is a type of the world. And he had a promised land that he wanted to bring them, a wealthy place. But that first generation, you read that in Numbers 13 and 14, Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4, never made it into that place. Why? Doubt, unbelief, amen, talking against what God said. You can't talk against the word of God and expect to get to your worth of place. They did, and they never made it. Matter of fact, they got God so mad, God was, God was going to kill them. If Moses hadn't interceded, God would have wiped them out right then and there. Because he was fed up because they had tempted him ten times. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. Amen. And you want to please God because faith releases the grace of God in your life. The favor of God is released when you operate in faith. Because Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. He's what? He's God. And God doesn't lie, and God doesn't change, and God keeps his word. Thank God he's not like people. I'm talking about Christian people, even ministers. Say stuff and, and, and never keep their word. That's called lying. I'm very careful about the things that I promise. If I say to you, I'm going to your house at 5 o'clock, I'll be there at 10 of you can go to the bank on it. You ask anybody that knows me, send them to my ministry. Amen. And if by, if by some chance something happens that's beyond my control, that's why they have cell phones. And I'm going to call you up and say, hey, I'm running late because, you know, somebody let the air out of my tire or something, whatever, you know. But I'm gonna, that's beyond my control. But see, you know, we're supposed to imitate God. The Bible says be imitators of God. And the Bible says in Jeremiah 1, 12, God watches over his word to perform it. And there are people just running off at the mouth, saying all kinds of stuff, making all kinds of promises, and don't even keep their word. You know, that's dangerous. Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, says it's better to, not to make a vow than to make a vow to God and not keep it. Huh? It can cost you your life. Hmm? See, one of the things that we're lacking is the fear of the Lord in the, in, in, in the church. That's why people do some of the stuff that they do. But, you know, people are starting to drop dead. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a few Ananias in, in you know, in the church. Uh, and uh, I think people jerk the slack out of themselves. That the blessing of Abraham may come on the Gentiles. Now, Look at what it says in verse 9. So then those who are of faith are blessed with the believing Abraham. So if you operate by faith, you're what? Blessed with believing Abraham. In other words, that the power of that blessing, that empowerment to prosper will come on you. Amen? Will manifest. I should say manifest. It's, it's already on you. But it will manifest. But you have to operate by faith. Look at Genesis 12. Genesis 12. It says this, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, 
and from your family and from your father's house in a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. That means I'm empowered to prosper you. That's what blessing means. And make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Be the reason for prosperity so you can be a blessing. There's actually two reasons, two reasons, and I'm going to get a little ahead of myself. <clears throat> there's two reasons for prosperity. There's actually, there's actually three, three. One, one is found in Psalm 35, 27. That says, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. It gives God great pleasure to see his children prosper. Doesn't it give you, you as a, fa a father or a mother, great pleasure in your children? Of course it does. Matter of fact, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, not Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for those whose heart is loyal toward him, that he may show himself strong on their behalf. God is chomping at the bit to bless people. God is not in the cursing business. Amen? Jesus came to, to, to show us the Father. He said, to, he, he said to one of his disciples, they said, show us the Father. If you see me, you've seen the Father. Amen? And he just said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's the devil that's making people sick, stealing their money, oppressing them. He said, I can't that you may have life. No. And I'm going to tell you something. The Bible said, if God be for you, Romans 8, 31, 32, if God be for you, who can be against you? I don't care what's going on in this world system. What schemes men have, devils have. If God is for me, he can prosper me in the worst economy. He's got a proven record. Amen. I see where he prospered. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the midst of captivity, Babylonian captivity. He prospered them. God is well able, folks. The problem is not with God. Amen. Look no further but in the mirror. And you'll find where the problem is. Because the problem is not with God. God is not. The Bible says in Isaiah, his arm is not short that he can't save and his ear is not dull that he can't hear. And he's definitely not blind. Amen. So it says, verse 3, and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. Be very careful about putting your mouth on people that are walking close to God. Amen. And I will curse him and curse you, and, 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 and you all the families of the earth be blessed. So that's the will of God. All the families of the earth be blessed. Everybody. Amen. Does it make a difference what your skin color is? What your gender is? Amen. Whether you live in Africa, Egypt, China, does it make any difference? Amen. God wants all the families to receive the blessing, the empowerment that was on Abram, because that's the same blessing he put on Adam, and it's the same blessing that he put on Noah, and it came on Abraham, and it's an empowerment to prosper in life. And in one area is in riches. Huh? Does that mean God's going to make us all a millionaire? No, not necessarily. To be rich means to have more than you need. Amen? And the Bible teaches that God gives money to people according to their ability. You'll find that in the book of uh, Matthew, the 25th chapter, the parable of the talents. When it talks about talents there, it's not talking about whether you can play the piano, amen, play the guitar or sing. It's talking about, it's a measure of money. It's a talent, it's something that they measured gold and, 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 and precious stones with. And it actually, actually says his money. He came to let me give account to the Lord's money. What you do with my money? And it says he, he, to one, he gave one talent, to one two, and to one five, according to their ability. Now, there will be people in the body of Christ that God will make millionaires out of because they can handle it. See, some people can't handle it. You know, I pastored for 14 years, two congregations. I remember one guy came to my church, and he was, he was bound on cocaine, and he was separated from his wife, and he was just a mess. And he got right with God and, <clears throat> and um, you know, got him filled with the Holy Ghost, and then his, got reconciled with his wife, got a job, started working, doing well. After a while, you know, I, I didn't see him uh, in church too often, and I inquired, you know, why he wasn't coming to church, and he said, well, I'm working. That's a bad sign when you start putting 
work before God. Hello. Now, we, we have to work, but, you know, you can't work seven days a week and he, have no time for God. And then he came into a, a, a settlement. I think it was like a $100,000 settlement that had been, you know, put away for a long time. And God gave him a breakthrough, and he gave the, he gave the church $100. That's a bad sign when you start robbing God. Amen. When you forget that it's God that delivered you. And, I, you know, I, I didn't get into the money aspect with him, but I did, you know, encourage him to he needed to be at church and so forth and so on. And he didn't listen to me. And after a while, he got back on drugs, and his wife and him split up. Didn't get right with God then. I think a year or two later, his wife died of cancer. Young, too. Late 30s, I think. Maybe, maybe early 40s. And a couple of years later, he died in a car crash. I hope to God he got right with God, otherwise he, he split hell wide, wide open. Are you following me? Yeah, this business of one saved always saves a life from the devil. Amen? You can't live in sin and die in sin and expect to go to heaven. I don't care if you spoke in tongues. Hmm? I've seen people that speak in tongues, shout, and go back to that lifestyle. And die of drug overdoses. You telling the truth, Angel? Huh? You're probably thinking about one person right off the bat. All right. So it says, So Abram, verse four, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy five years old when he departed from Haran. Now it's never too old to start obeying God, amen. But I want you to notice that if you want to get into your wealthy place, you've got to obey God. Huh? You've got to obey God. You've got to obey the word. There are two ways that God speaks to us, through the word, the logos, the written word. But he also leads us by his spirit, Romans 8, 14. Amen. God will prompt you to do certain things. You have to learn to be obedient to God in both areas. And I'm talking about consistently, not hit and miss. If some people went to work the way they came to church, they get fired. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching so good. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Some people, you know, you see them one Sunday, you see them. One Sunday, you don't. Or else they come an hour late to church. Huh? As you know, I, I make the rounds of different churches, and I'm not going to mention the church. There's one church I go to. Bless their darling hearts. That'd be an hour, an hour into the service, man, and people say, I'm, I'm halfway through my, my message, and people are coming in. And then they come in, instead of sitting down quietly, they're, they're greeting everybody while I'm preaching. <laughs> yeah. You know, you w wonder about some of these people, if their elevator goes all the way to the top floor, you know? I mean, dear Lord. No wonder the devil's beating their brains in. So go over one chapter to chapter 13. It says, Then Abram went up from the Egypt and his wife and all he had and lot with him to the south. And Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. One chapter later, he's very rich. Go over to uh, the 24th chapter, verse 34 through 36. Now, he wanted to get a, a wife for his son Isaac. And so he sent his servant to get her, and he, the servant prayed and asked God, you know, certain signs that he wanted to know that that was the right woman, and God fulfilled that. And then he, he goes to Rebecca's family's house, and, he, and he's talking to her, her brothers and, you know, her family members because, you know, he's, he's got to ha give them a dowry. That was the way you got a wife. You, and he, he, he came loaded, loaded down with, you know, camel full of clothes and gold. And so he says, uh, verse 34, so he said, I am Abraham's servant. And the Lord has blessed my master greatly. What is blessed? It's an empowerment to prosper in every area. It was a blessing that was upon Adam, then Noah, then Abraham, and then to us because we're in Christ Jesus. We just read it. 
the Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he has given him flocks and herds, silver, gold, male, and female servants, and camels and donkeys. Huh? He was blessed greatly. Now look at Proverbs, the 10th chapter. Proverbs, the, third, the, the 10th chapter. Now, you said you had a water up here for me, but I, oh, there it is. There it is. Proverbs, the 10th chapter, verse 22. It says, the blessing of the Lord. What blessing is that? The one that's on you and me. Abraham's blessing. The blessing of the Lord makes one what? The word rich in the Hebrew there means rich to accumulate, to grow, or make rich, to gain riches, to become wealthy. Now, that's hard for the religious mind, amen, to grasp. And a lot of people have been religiously brainwashed instead of New Testament taught. Because there are, you know, ministers that teach people that to have work, material things is wrong, that God, you know, you know poverty is uh, humility and, and piety. And, and that's a lie from the pit of hell. The devil don't want you to have any money because you can't be a good testimony for God being broke. Huh? Hello. I mean, you ever read the book of Malachi, the third chapter? Some people don't like that chapter, but, you know, it's the ch chapter about tithing. He said, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. It may be my house and prove me. If I'll not open the ones of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you, there is no more need, and I'll rebuke the devour for your sakes. But it goes on to say, down around verse 12, and all the nations should call, call you blessed. Hmm? We, need, we need to have some Abrahams walking around today. You, you, that, that will attract people. Hello. Particularly, listen, the worse the economy becomes, and you're prospering, man, you'd be shining like a light in the dark. Huh? You know, if, you, if you're a joyful person, people think you're smoking dope. They'll actually say that. You know, what kind of drugs are you using? You're always so happy. I'm serious. And you start prospering financially. Amen. Driving a nice new car. Woo, just bought me a new home like my sister did. Huh? Single mom. Got herself her own place. Glory. Amen. See, she latched on to the word. This will work for anybody who will believe. Hmm? I don't choose to believe. I'm not going to let the devil talk me out of God's blessings. And it says here, the blessing of the Lord maketh one rich, and he had no sorrow with it. You know what the word sorrow means in the Hebrew? Toil, labor, sorrow, hardship, pain, hurt, and grievous. Do you know why toil came on the earth? You read over there in Genesis. It's, uh, I think it's the second or third chapter. Because Adam sinned. Adam was never. Now, he was supposed to take care of the garden. Cultivate it. We do have to work, but God doesn't want you to toil. There's a difference between working and toiling. And people today are toiling. I know people that are working three jobs. Hello, just, just to make ends meet. And still struggling. That's not what, where you and I are supposed to live in. We're supposed to live in the blessing. In the blessing. Amen. Now, there, there are things that you have to do to activate this blessing. First of all, you've got to get saved. You've got to get born again. But then go over to Isaiah 1. Are you getting anything out of this? Amen. Isaiah 1, verse 19. If you are willing and obedient. So you have the will to be obedient. O obedience is an act of our will. Huh? It's like loving your wife or your husband. It's an act of your will. Not a feeling. 
Hello? Because sometimes if you're married, you know, your husband or your wife will rub you the wrong way. Can I get a witness in the house? I know some of you guys don't want to say amen because your wife is sitting next to you, but it's all right. God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. See, this is a two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12, right? One side, if you obey it, you'll be blessed. The other side, you disobeyed. We just read here. The same word will devour you. Huh? See, God says in Deuteronomy 30th chapter on 14, he said, this day I put before you death and life. Choose life that you may live. And then he tells you what life is. And loving the Lord your God with all your heart and obeying him. It's very simple. It's, it's a, a test that has two questions. Huh? And God gives you the answer. And it's amazing how many people are flunking. Huh? Now, the Bible says in, in the book of Isaiah uh, 5.13, my people have gone into captivity because of lack of knowledge. Hosea 4.6 says my people perish because of lack of knowledge. See, lack of knowledge will cause you to be in captivity financially or any other area. So go over to the book of Proverbs, the fourth chapter. So the first thing that we need to do after we get born again, we have to seek after wisdom. Amen. Amen. Now, wisdom <clears throat> is the application of knowledge. See, what you're receiving right now, when, I, when, I, when your pastor is here ministering or I'm ministering or somebody else is ministering with the anointing of God, you're receiving knowledge. You're getting to know the ways of God, which are higher, according to Isaiah 55. But when you take the knowledge and apply it, amen, by faith and do it, it's called wisdom. Hmm? See? And so it says in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, Verse 7 and 9, wisdom is the principal thing. What is the principal thing? It means the most important thing is, is wisdom. Therefore, get wisdom and you get, get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor. When you embrace her, she will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. She will deliver to you. Go to the 8th chapter. Verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers create justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all the judges of the earth. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Now, notice you have to seek wisdom what? diligently. It says, riches and honor are with me. Endure in riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yes, than the fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. Now, people have things backwards. They're, they're chasing after money and the material things. That's why they don't come to church. Too busy mo working, working, got to work, make money. Now, you should work, and you have to work. You can't just stay home and read the Bible. But, boy, you should be spending some time seeking some wisdom. How do you do that? Well, it's easy today. I mean, I mean, there's so much. Right now we have, I think, 40 videos online that people can watch for free, Spanish and English, so they can get into the Word. That's what I do. I go in, in the Internet and look up Brother Hagen, Kenneth Hagen, who's gone home to be with the Lord, one of the best ministers we've had in our time, in my opinion. And I put them on while I'm cooking breakfast, cooking dinner, doing whatever. And I have a DVR, and I record, you know, people like Bill Winston, Jerry Seville, Kenneth Copeland, John Hagee, and some other people. And I feed my spirit every day, several times a day. Amen. And when I go to the throne... <laughs> I have reading materials. With good teaching. Huh? See? Oh, the Bible says make the most of your time. Ephesians 5. 
And some of us visit the throne quite often <laughs> and spend long time there. So why not feed your spirit? <laughs> Amen. Now it says, um, verse 18, Riches and honor are with me, and doing riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yes, than fine gold, and my revenue is than choice silver. I traverse the way of righteousness in the midst of the path of justice. Verse 21, that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth. That I may fill what? The treasures. Glory to God. But notice what he said. That they may cause those who love me. You got to love the word. Amen. Gee, how can you not love the word? The Bible says my people perish because of lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6, Isaiah 5, 13. My people have gone into captivity because of lack of knowledge. And Jesus said in John 8, 31, 32, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen? Now, folks, you know, it's not fun being bound. I don't want to live in bondage. I want to be set free from everything that the devil has brought in my life. And I'm working on it because you've got to work at it. How do you do that? You seek after wisdom. Amen. You seek after, after the knowledge of God, and then you apply that knowledge. You become a doer of the word, not a hearer only. You'll find that in James 1, 19 through 27. Now you understand why God told Joshua, and he didn't just say that to Joshua. He told that to everybody. He's revealing the secret of success. He said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it, what? Day and night. Now, that doesn't mean that you stay home and just read the Bible and won't go to work. But we have today no excuse for not getting to the Word we, with technology. Man, we got iPhones. Somebody probably watching, watching Sozo right now on their iPhone. Amen? You can get the Word. There's, there's absolutely no reason why. You know, get in the Word and get knowledge and, get, and, and then apply wisdom to your life. Amen? Because it's a... Why do you think all this technology was invented? Hello? It came from God. Now, we know that the world has perverted it and used it to produce filth and stuff. But God brought it into existence to get the word into people because this gospel has to be preached throughout all the world. Then the end will come. Amen? That's, that's the only reason I'm on social media. I'm not on social media to tell you what I ate for lunch. I mean, dear God, I mean, some people, it's a... All kinds of crazy stuff on there. No, you'll find me. I put the word on there all the time. And I put my videos on there. And that's why I'm on Instagram. I'm not Instagram. I'm Facebook and Twitter. And then I just start, got into Periscope. And, and I Periscope people and do it all. Get the gospel out. Do my part. Amen? So then the end will come. And I get my glorified body. I want to look 20 again, you know? Get my, my, my black hair, man. Man, I used to have some my black hair, bro. Glory. Look forward to that. I used to have six-pack abs. Now I've been dealing with Dunn Belt. You know, Dunn Gone Beyond Your Belt. <laughs> go to the book of, uh, go to the book of uh, uh, Job. Job. Job 36. This is a powerful scripture right here. Now, if this doesn't do something for you, I, I, I don't know. I, I think you just, you know, need to be raised up from the dead or something. But Verse 5, Job 36. Behold, God is mighty, but despises no one. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not preserve the life of the wicked, but he gives justice to the oppressed. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but they are on the throne with kings. The Bible says that God has made his kings and priests unto him. Revelation 1, I think it's around verse 6. Kings and priests. Have you ever seen a broke king? We're royalty. They are on the throne with kings. He has seated them forever. He has seated them forever. And they are exalted. And if they are bound in feathers, held in cords of affliction, then he tells them their words and their transgressions that they have acted defiantly. In other words, if you're bound because 
There's sin in your life. God will show you where the sin is, and it's up to you to repent. Amen? It's up to you to repent. Come out of bondage. He also opens their ears to instructions and commands that they turn from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, if they what? Obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in what? That's pretty plain to me. And their years in what? My, my New King James Bible says pleasures. God's not opposed to you having pleasures. And I'm talking about godly pleasures. Amen. You know, there are godly ple pleasures. I mean, being married, having a good wife or a good husband and enjoying, you know, that intimacy between a husband and wife, that's pleasure. That's, that's godly. Amen. Now, if you ask how a marriage is doing that, then, then you're in sin. And fornicators don't enter the kingdom of God. Neither do adulterers. Amen. But that's pleasure, and that's good pleasure. And there's pleasure in having enough money that you can say, baby, come on, let's go. Let's go, let's go for a two-week cruise. Where do you want to go? Amen? And, and, and you know, you don't, you don't look for the cheapest cabin. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Are you following? Because you got the money. God's not opposed to that. Are you following me? God's not opposed to you driving a nice car. Having to fly somewhere, fly business. You get that coach stuff, you know. All cramped up in there, you know. Ne sitting next to Big Bubba next to you. Know. <laughs> Say, man, you need to get two, two, two seats instead of one the next time, you know. You're sitting on my lap here. <laughs> Amen. Now it says, verse 12, but if they do not obey, they shall perish by the sword. And they shall die without knowledge. See, God says, this day I put before you, death and life. Choose life that you may live. And he says, life is in obeying what I say. Very simple. All right, now, go over to the book of 2 Corinthians 9. Now, the other thing, if you want to enter into this wealthy place, you have to learn to operate in the laws of sowing and reaping. I told you that when God created his man, you can read it in Genesis 1, he blessed them and empowered them, and then he began to tell them about the seed how it produces after its kind. And he revealed to him the laws of sowing and reaping, which he in turn revealed to his sons. And we see them in Genesis 4 operating, bringing offerings and first fruits to God. Where did they get that? From their father. Where did the father get From God. Now you have to operate in this principle. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken, and run over. Shall men give unto you. But with the measure that you meet, be measured back to you. See, some people want to receive, but they don't want to give. Well, wouldn't it be dumb if you had a nice, fertile field out there, right? And you're sitting out there having a pity party because there's nothing growing. And somebody comes along and says, well, why are you looking so sad? Man, I'm hungry. Nothing, nothing's growing in this place. Well, did you sell anything? No. Wouldn't that be stupid? Well, we got people operating that way in the body of Christ. Get mad at God. Why they can't pay their bills? Have you tried sowing seed? Huh? And listen to me. Tithing is not sowing seed. I know people teach that, but, that, but, but it's not. The Bible talks about paying tithes. Even Jesus approved paying tithes, Matthew 23, 23. Hebrews 7 said, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and there are people teaching that Melchizedek was, you know, Noah's son. No, he wasn't. I, you know, I wish people read the Bible. I'm talking about ministers. I mentioned some of them. You know who they are. I heard them say, every time I heard them say, show me scripture and verse, you know. They don't ever quote it, any scripture and verse. But he's not Noah's son or grandson or whatever they're, they're teaching. Melchizedek was the Christ incarnate in the Old Testament. He had no beginning, no end, no, no genealogy, no mother, no father. And when Jesus rose up from the dead, he was, the psalm said, he was made a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. How can, how can God make him? At the order because of the of a fallen man. <laughs> and it says Abraham paid tithes. Why is it paid tithes? Because Leviticus 27, verse 30 through 32 says, The tithe is holy unto the Lord. And back then under the law, if you use any part of it, you owe 20% to God in interest. I, I actually believe that tithing opened up the windows of heaven. How much is going to come back to you is, is, is a result of sowing seed. And that's called offerings. And that's what you find here in 2 Corinthians, the, the ninth chapter. 
2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. And the Bible always tells you to sow bountifully. Now, bountifully is in accordance to what you have, not what you don't have. Amen? See, you, you may have had $2 for your name. That's all you had. All the money in the world. That's all you had. And you gave a dollar in the offering, and somebody gave $100, but they got $50,000 in the bank. You gave the larger offering in the eyes of God because it's according to what you have, not what you don't have. And you do it in faith. Amen? Now, and in the, the sixth chapter, it says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Now, if you start reading chapter 8, you'll find that he's receiving an offering for the saints in need who are going through famine in Jerusalem. Now, it says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This cannot be talking about the tithe. Because the word tithe means 10%. Amen? So if you've made $10 this week, you, a dollar belongs to God, that's tithe. But here, you determine how much you're going to sow. So, you know, when you get money, whichever way it comes in, whether it comes in through your paycheck, don't listen, don't limit God to your paycheck. If you limit God to your paycheck, you're making your job your source. And God wants to be your source. God, listen, God has a million different ways to bring money to you. Don't try to tell him how to do it either. Hello. Now, I believe in getting checks in the mail, and I've gotten some that way, but I don't limit God to that. How are you following? Some people, that's all. Uh, they're always looking for checks in the mail, checks in the mail. Well, you know, God can give you money other ways. Are you following me? Man, when I passed, uh, you know, my church, I, I used to say to these guys, and, uh, you know, uh, Angel probably remembers this. I say, if a, if a donkey is kicking at the door, you remember that, David? Kicking at the door, and he got saddlebags on him, let him in. I don't care. We'll clean up the poop, the poop later. <laughs> but if he don't have nothing, don't let him in. Why? Because God... God may be meeting my need that way. Amen. I mean, God has done it. Didn't he feed Elijah? Meat and bread through ravens twice a day. I don't know where the raven got the bread and the meat. And I don't care. I don't care how God gets it to me as long as it comes. <laughs> Amen. And Jesus had to pay taxes one time. And he told Peter to go fishing. And the fish had the money he needed to pay his taxes in his mouth. So why are you limiting God with your job? Your job can't keep up with the Joneses. Have you noticed that inflation always grows faster than what they pay you at work? Amen? The sad thing about it is today, the sad thing about it, now, I, I'm not going to include every company in the world, but I've seen uh, quite a few of them that really don't care about their employees. They just treat them like pawns. Hello? They're indispensable. Now, I'm not saying that every company is like that. There may be some real good ones out there that do care, and they probably are. But there are a lot of them that don't. Are you following me? So don't look to them as your source. No, God is your source. Operate in the principles of faith, in, in faith that I'm sharing with you. This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So how, how, do, you want to, how do you want to reap? Huh? How do you want it to come back to you? See, with the measure that you show. It's going to come back to you. That's talking about offering. Because you control the offering. You take the 10%, you got 90%. Now you decide how much of the 90% you're going to use for seed. Are you following? Now it says, so let each one give as he has purpose in his heart. Now that's not talking about the blood pump. That's talking about your spirit. You purpose in your spirit to give. Because you give in faith. See, the just shall live by faith. Right? That's mentioned four times. Hebrews 10, 38, Galatians 3, 11, Romans 1, 17, Habakkuk 2, 4. The just shall live by faith. Huh? So you give from a heart of faith. The other thing is when it comes to offerings, the Holy Spirit inside of you would lead you sometimes to give a certain amount or to sow into uh, a, an individual that has a need or a, another ministry. And let me just tell you something. In Malachi, Malachi I, I, you know, I, <clears throat> in Malachi, the third chapter, it says, will a man rob God? Verse 8. And then what have we robbed you? In tithe and offering. It tells you to do both. The word tithe it means 10%. Offering means a present or a gift. Then he says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. He didn't say bring all the tithe and offering to the storehouse. 
Why, why is that? Well, I believe that the storehouse, back in the Old Testament, the storehouse was, was by the temple where, where, the, where the priest would keep the, the stuff that the people brought, and they fed themselves and took care of ministry stuff. The storehouse today is the local church. And a local pastor should be, should be supported, if, he, if he's doing his job and feeding the people, by faithful people tithing into that church. That's how his needs will be met. That's how, you know, the ministry is taken care of, and it runs. But you've got to remember in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 11 through 16, it takes the five-fold ministry to perfect the saints. A pastor has a congregation. The other four don't. I believe they're supposed to be supported by offerings. Hmm? And there are, there, there are two things that the Bible teaches. It says, verse Galatians 6, 2, let him who has taught the word communicate with him who teaches. If you're being blessed by a ministry, you should get back financially. Paul said, and anointed by the Spirit of God in 1 Corinthians 9, if we have sown unto you a spiritual thing, and is there any great thing if we receive material things? That's called giving and receiving. You receive spiritually, you give back material. Are you following? That's, that's a biblical principle. And, and, and it's ordained of God according to 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 14. And then, and, and then God at, at, at times will lead you by the Spirit to do a specific thing. You know, if a minister is believing God for you know, say $30,000 to do something for, for, for the Lord, and he's got his faith out. Well, that money doesn't come from, from heaven and rains down in the backyard. I wish it did, to be frank with you. I mean, because sometimes, you know, people take them a long time to obey God. I had a lady, you know, a few years back, sent a check. She used to be a member of my church. Moved to another state, sent a check, $300 to the ministry. And, and then she had a note. She said, you know, God's been dealing with me for a year to send you this money. I thought, my dear God, a whole year. To send three hundred dollars, how are you going to manage money for God if you can't let it go when He tells you to? <laughs> so it would be easy if God just rained it down in the backyard every day. Ask anybody in ministry; they'll say, "Yeah, I would like that too." Because <laughs> people aren't always obedient, and the Bible says, in uh, I think it's uh, First Peter, the last chapter, that we can hasten the coming of the Lord. Well, if we can hasten, which means speed it up, we can slow it down, right? See, because God has to find, why did it take God a couple of thousand years to find a guy named Abraham? Huh? I mean, there were a lot of people between Adam and Abraham. But why? Because he, he found a man that was willing to do what he would tell him to do. To the point to offer up his only son. Hmm? Yeah, there's one time over there in Ezekiel 22 where God was looking for an intercessor that he would have mercy on the land. And he couldn't find one. Ezekiel 22, I think, verse 30. He said, um, so let each one give as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves what? Now, some people think it says tearful, but it's cheerful. <laughs> Amen? See, I used to tell people in my church when I pastored, you know, if your attitude, oh, they're talking about offering again, keep your dollar in your pocket, please. Go buy yourself a cup of coffee. You can't do it now, but back then you could. Really, I used to tell them that. Because God's not going to bless you. Your wrong attitude. Amen. You should be joyful. The Bible says in Acts 20 and 35 that, Je that Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we're going to see here why. He says, God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to what? Make all grace abound toward you. Giving with the right attitude releases the favor of God in your life. Because giving is an act of faith. Amen. It's a great act of faith. And giving represents most closely the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. It's an act of love. He says in John 15, he said, greater love has no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. And when you give so that someone else can benefit, so, so the gospel can be preached to somebody, you're laying down your life so people can come into the kingdom. Because that money represents your life. The reason that they pay you at work is because you gave them your life for 40 hours, how many hours you work, to do what they want, so they can prosper, and they compensated you, your, your, your time with money. And you're taking a portion of that money, and you're laying it down so somebody can come in. That's a great act of love. And God says, when you do that, he says, I'm going to cause all grace to abound towards you. You know, when the Philippian church were the only church that supported Paul, the other ones didn't, and he was under financial stress. You read it from uh, uh, Philippians 4, 15 through 19. And he says to them, my God shall supply all your need. See, giving with the right attitude doesn't just cause money to come back to you. It causes favor to come on you. Glory to God. It causes God to do stuff for you that normally don't happen to other people. 
is able to cause all grace to abound towards you. That you, listen to this, that you always have an all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. The first reason for prosperity is that God, Psalm 35, 27, God delights in the prosperity of his servants. He gets God's great pleasure. The second reason is found in Malachi, the, th the third chapter, around verse 12. And all the nations should call you bl blessed because they see the blessing of the Lord manifested materially in your life. Here's the other reason. That you may have abundance for every good work. God wants you to prosper so you can keep some money into good ministries. So the gospel can be preached. So people can be saved. So people can be set free. Then it says, as it is written, he is the person abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower. God supplies seed for you to sow. Don't eat your seed. And one of the ways that he does it is found in, in Ephesians 4.28. It says, let him that steals steal no more, but let him labor with his hands to give to him who has need. Well, who is the person that has need? The people in the ministry. It, it was never the will of God in the Old Testament or the New Testament, although ministers have had to do it, for them to work a secular job if they're called into full-time ministry. Not the will of God. Because it takes away energy and time that you can be giving yourself over to prayer and the word. That's the reason they elected deacons in the church, not, 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 not to you know, rule the pastor in Acts, the sixth chapter. It says, he, Peter said, it's not right that we should be waiting on table. We should, we, you know, elect men among you that can do this. We're going to dedicate ourselves to prayer and the word. You know, you got to go out here and work a secular job and put up with all the garbage that you had to put up in, in secular work. And you, just, you come home, you're tired. Hello, it's hard to get into the word then. Now it says, verse 10. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. So there's, there's a, when God gives you money for your job, some of it is for you to use for what? For food, for your necessity of life, but some of it is for you to sow seed. Bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So he does three things. He causes all grace to abound towards you. He multiplies your seed sown, and then he increases, increases the fruits of your righteousness. Paul sent to the church in, Phil in, in, in Philippi. He says, I'm not looking for money from you. I'm looking for the fruit that goes into your account. Huh? You start supporting ministry every time that somebody gets saved, somebody, you know, something happens to that ministry, you, it's in your account. It says, verse 11, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality. Here it is again. The reason for prosperity is so you can be liberal. You can keep sowing, which causes thanksgiving to, uh, through us to God. Now, verse 12 tells you what good ground is. What ministry is good ground? Listen to this, and I'll close with this. For the administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but is also abounding through many thanksgiving to God. Good ground is a ministry that is meeting the needs of people, and God is receiving the praise. That's good ground. Amen? Did you get anything out of that? Well, let's stand up and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Glory to God. I don't know about you, but I preach myself happy. Thank you, Lord. You know, faith doesn't come by having heard. It comes by hearing. You have to hear the same truths over and over and over and over and over and over so that your faith stands strong. Amen. I've been in the ministry 34 years. You know how many times I preach these things? But they never get old. Amen. They never get old. And preaching it to you builds my own faith. Strengthen my own faith. Father, we thank you and praise you for the word of God that we've heard this morning. Thank you, Lord God, that we're doers of the word, not hearers only. And Lord, if we've missed it in some area, in this area of finances where you've led us to give and we have been obedient, we ask you to forgive us. That's you. Ask God to forgive you right now for any unfaithfulness in this area of paying tithes, giving offerings. And make a decision today, Lord, from now on, I'm going to obey you in these areas. I'm going to operate in faith. I'm going to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, I, well, I do have